The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to episode 158 of the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. And this week, we are wrapping up 2020 with Bram Stoker nominated author Craig DeLuey. Uh, he has been here before. I love speaking with Craig, and you are going to really enjoy our conversation. You know, we're going to be talking about books that come out at the right time. So, you know, that X factor, the things you can't plan for. Uh, he has advice for authors, which is uh, starts with being as prolific as possible when you're writing. You know, we're also talking about his Tank series that came out this year that he self-published, uh, which is really exciting because we're going to be talking a little bit about his his uh, abilities as a hybrid author. Because, I mean, you know, like I said, he self-published his books, but he's also a Bram Stoker <laughs> nominated author with uh, with uh, some publishing houses. And uh, so, yeah, he kind of uh, jumps back and forth and and uh, has a really good time with it. And that's I think that's fascinating and a lot of fun to talk about. So all that's coming up here in just a few minutes. So make sure you stay tuned for that. This is the last episode of 2020. Obviously, I mean, you know, New Year's is just a couple of days away. <laughs> so I, I hope you have had a good year for me here at the show. It's you know, it's been an interesting year for sure. Um, but overall, I, th I think it's been a good one. This time last year, I was celebrating episode 100, and then I took like two weeks off to kind of recover and think about what I wanted to do for this year, and then uh, then got things going. And it's just amazing to me that you know going from episode 100 to today, 158, and even though I'd taken a break and took a little bit to get things going earlier this year, still put in 58 episodes in a 52 week period so somehow i still <laughs> got all 52 you know, regular episodes in plus another six bonuses which i think i probably put in a few more bonuses than that throughout the year in order to keep up at this point but i man, i'm just blown away i mean I, I just can't believe uh you know 58 episodes in the year and uh yeah there's been a it's been fantastic. Been some really incredible authors, uh, a few return guests like today with Craig DeLuy, but uh, also there's been a, a whole lot of brand new first time authors. And uh, whether I'm, I'm talking to an exciting new author or an accomplished one uh, who's a bestseller, you know, it's been a lot of fun. And obviously, yeah, even the <laughs> getting to talk to a couple of the celebrity authors that uh, that we had on the show this year has been a lot of fun as well so you know uh, yes indeed I'd, I'd have to say this has been a really good year for the show um, in spite of the complications that 2020 has presented uh, but you know and, and it's a it's a good sign that creative type people are gonna thrive uh, no matter what you know you gotta you gotta put that output out there you gotta get it out and it's been, it's been really my pleasure to speak to every one of them and to bring the show to you. And, uh, you know, so I want to thank not only my incredible guests that I've had this year, but I also want to thank each and every one of you out there listening. You guys are incredible. Um, watching the numbers, you know, December's been really, really great. I, I'm guessing a lot of people got Kindles for, uh, for Christmas, and so everybody's checking out to see what to, uh, what to listen to. <laughs> so that's really awesome uh, numbers have been fantastic this month so thank you so much for finding the show if it's your first time listening or if this is your 158th time listening you know regardless I appreciate you uh, taking the time to check this out and yeah I, as always I want to invite you to check out the backlist because there's been some amazing authors on here and those episodes will always be available for you to go back and find uh find a brand new author so speaking of episodes and breaks um, i am going to be taking a little bit of a break so no episode next week on the 5th of january 
Uh, we'll be back right now. The plan is to be back by the 12th of January. I've got a few things I'm working on for the show, and I, I just I need to go ahead and take that time to iron out some details. Got some exciting new things coming to the show, and I will, I want to make sure that that's ready without having to rush anything. So uh, again, go back, check out the backlist, and uh, share your favorite episodes with uh, with authors. Uh, I've also got my own book coming out this week, so I've been really focused on that the past couple of days. And <laughs> real quick, a funny story, something that happened to me. So uh, this is my first time ever doing a pre-order, and you know I've, I've heard authors talking about, oh gosh, you know you got to meet that deadline, or if you don't meet the deadline, uh, then you know like Amazon, which is who I'm publishing through. Amazon will ban you from doing a pre-order for the next year. So when I got the notice, okay, you have until midnight of the 27th. Okay, great, got it. And uh, Saturday morning and Sunday morning, I woke up early, like real early, you know, my well, earlier than my usual mornings, and got to work on editing and making sure that I had everything the way I had wanted it. Worked Sunday throughout the day on formatting and making sure that I had it how I wanted it. Around uh, like 4.30, 5 o'clock that afternoon, I'm, I go ahead and log into Amazon to check some things out and see what's going on. Ah, oh, look at there. There's a timer in my back office letting me know I had like 45 minutes to go before my time was up. Because as it turns out, even though I deal with, with uh, time zones with the show all the time, talking to authors all over the world, uh, for some reason I did not catch on that GMT is not general mountain time. <laughs> no, that's Greenwich Mean Time, and I should have known that, but I just, I, I just, I don't know, I totally overlooked it. And so Greenwich Mean Time, of course, that's in in London, and uh, yeah, so I had less than an hour to finish what I was doing and go ahead and get the book up, upload the file into Amazon. And, uh, thankfully, I made it. I made the deadline, and uh, the book is prepared. So a novel idea is right there in Amazon. I announced it to you last week, letting you know that the book was ready to go. But oh, that was, uh, I literally felt my stomach turn into knots <laughs> when I saw that timer. Uh, oh man, that was uh, quite the night to, uh, to uh, once I got that done. But uh, you know, if, uh, anyway, but the book is available for pre-order. It comes out New Year's Eve. It is 99 cents right now for a pre-order, and I want to thank all of you who have already pre-ordered it, because I've had a really great turnout for this pre-order, and I really appreciate it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes for you if you want to check out the book, if you want to go ahead and pre-order it. Again, it's going to be 99 cents, and uh, coming out New Year's Eve. I'm so excited, just so excited. Yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, once again, it's a novel idea. That's my mystery thriller that I am putting out about a author who may or may not be killing for his next story. Uh, I also want to thank Scribner, who I wrote this story on. I did all of my writing there on Novel Idea and all of my writing, period. Now, I do through Scribner. I have both the desktop version and the app, and I just kind of go back and forth. Wherever I am, I have the ability to write anywhere because of that, and Scrivener is just incredible, and uh, we just uh, secured a deal again. We're going to be, they're going to be with us for at least another six months, so I'm, I'm just so happy to have them here as a part of this show. If you're interested in Scrivener, make sure you are listening to this advertisement about them, and I don't want you to forget that if you're going to go ahead and download Scrivener, then use code CHAPTER to save yourself 20% on the regular desktop version, just like I have. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener writing software, built by writers for writers. I'm 
so happy to be continuing our relationship into 2021. Also want to thank my podcast network that uh, became part of, oh my gosh, two years ago now, uh, Pop Goes the Culture Network, uh, home to about a dozen different podcasts and uh, brand new ones coming soon to the network, uh, but their flagship show, Pop Goes the Culture Podcast, they just came back this past week and uh, that was a lot of fun. They did a recap of season two of The Mandalorian, so if you are a fan of that show, if you are interested in what they have to talk about as they recap what was going on and things that are coming to that series and what's coming because of that this past series then make sure you check that out i i am a fan of mandalorian i think it was a fantastic season so that was a lot of fun to listen to and uh, make sure you click that link in the show notes for more from pop goes the culture i also want to thank project entertainment network my second podcast network i'm a part of and uh, so happy to be in with more than 35 shows in that network. Uh, shows of just about every genre you could think of. Uh, but uh, today I'm wanting to spotlight this incredible show called Wild Speculation. And uh, you know, this advertisement can tell you better than I can explain it. Welcome to Wild Speculation, a podcast where each episode is a short story that explores one of the many strange, wonderful, and sometimes disturbing worlds of speculative fiction. You can find us at wildspeculation.buzzsprout.com, on the Project Entertainment Network, and wherever else you find podcasts. So sit back, enjoy the story, and let your imagination run wild. All right, there you go. That was Wild Speculation, part of the Project Entertainment Network. And that is my pre-show. It's time for us to get on over to our interview with return guest, Bram Stoker, award-nominated author, Craig DeLuey. All right, Sample Chapter listeners, welcome back to another exciting episode. Hey, this week we have return guest, Craig DeLuey. He was with us uh, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, in September of 2019, uh, on episode 86. We were discussing his latest book at that time, Our War, which has uh, gone on to be quite the successful book. Uh, if you don't know, Craig DeLuey is a speculative fiction author covering genres like thriller, apocalyptic horror, sci-fi fantasy, lots of great work. Uh, his his books have been praised for their strong characters, action, and gritty realism. Each book promises an exciting experience with people you'll care about in a world that feels real. Craig, welcome back to the show. Jason, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to have you here. And uh, oh my gosh, what what a year it has been. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how are you doing? And uh, are you staying healthy? Yeah, I'm hanging tough. You know, I work at home, so... It wasn't a huge change for me, mm -hmm. but I, I've written about pandemics before, and, and, and I'm not going to call myself one of those authors like, you know, super prescient, um, but uh, I, I did write a book about a pandemic uh, a number of years ago. It was actually my first self-published book. It was back before ebooks were big, so it was, ex it was, a, it was a print on demand kind of thing. But I was always curious about pandemics, and I was like, well, what, what would that actually look like? So I did a lot of research, and scientists were warning us that this was coming back then, and uh, I they had pandemic response plans in place, and that's what I based the book on. And so when last November, when they quarantined a city of 11 million people in China, I was like, okay, we're in for it now. <laughs> so I started preparing then. Oh um, I wasn't prepared for how long it was going to take. Uh, and it, and it and it was difficult the the lockdown at first simply because you just don't know what's going to happen next mm -hmm. and uh, so that was pretty scary but um, like everything else you know humans are adaptive and like everything else we just got used to it and soldiered on now I'm just praying for a vaccine because I don't think anything else is going to stop this yeah absolutely uh, at, at the risk of sounding insensitive but I, I have a curiosity and i know i know listeners are going to be curious as well did you find a bump in sales on your pandemic book when uh, when this started 
Oh, a little bit, but I don't uh, flog stuff. You know, mm-hmm. like w- our war was about a president who refuses to leave office and it starts <laughs> a civil war. I mean, I had also, <laughs> I've been biting my tongue over and over again. Yeah. Saying, hey, you know, uh, this is kind of what was, was, was the, the book's about. Uh, the rhetoric, uh, some of the violence and how it escalates. and uh, But I, I didn't want to, I, I don't like to kind of take advantage of tragedy to sell stuff. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, yeah, so I, 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 I talked about it a little bit because I had some, some, I had done a lot of research and so I had things I could say, but uh, I, you know, I, I didn't push it too hard. And the, that book's so old that um it, it wasn't, uh, I, I saw some sales, but not a lot. And, and I was perfectly, uh, fine with that. Uh, the book was no longer relevant because we were living it in <laughs> <Yeah>. a way. <laughs> well, good for you though. I mean, and that's, I, I think that speaks to your, your moral, uh, standards that, that you didn't jump on that and, and do so, but I, yeah, I, I always that- feel, I don't like, I just feel funny doing, you know, just right. feel funny doing it. Um, mm-hmm. But I am proud of that book. It was recognized by two uh, websites for nurses and um, it made top top um, it was top 50 reading list for one. And I think a top 100 books of the year for two for that year for another. Um, so a lot of registered nurses were reading it and uh, which I thought which I would to me was the absolute better than sales, you know. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. That, that it was recognized as credible and it was actually on a reading list for nurses. Wow, fantastic. And that was uh, that was The Infection? No, my, The Infection is a zombie book. <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> I, hope, I hope that never... Oh becomes. gosh, let's not, let's not let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wrote a bunch of zombie books. No, that was a little self-published work called The Thin White Line. It was written like a... It, it was written in 2008, imagining that it's now past 2012 and a pan a, a, an influenza pandemic occurred in 2012. Okay. And it's, it's a little dry because it's sort of like, it's very technical. Uh, it's basically like, this is ha- what it looked like that year when, as this thing rolled out and then it, w- it was punctuated just for fun. These little stories like firsthand accounts, sort of world war Z style, mm-hmm. you know, uh, of what it was like to be a nurse or being government or be, you know, somebody else. Um, living through these horrible times. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, Hey, we got to talk about two of your books yeah. right <laughs> off the bat. So there we go. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. The one I'm nervous about now is our war. I'm hoping that one stays fiction. <laughs> oh, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Yeah. You, you and me both. Oh my yeah. gosh. Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, I was going to ask how 2020 is treating you uh, like as an author, but going through your Amazon, I see that your armor series came out like gangbusters Uh, books one through five, just in from February to April alone. Oh my gosh, man. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Doing great. Yeah. Those, you know, I, I, my career sort of has two sides to it. My fiction career. Mm -hmm. And one side of it is I write big idea standalone novels for, uh, big publishers. I've worked with Simon and Schuster in my current home is Hachette, uh, where I why I've, most of my books are through Orbit and my new my new horror novels through Red Hook, and uh, they're just fantastic to work with. And and they're the they're the company the guys who get me into big bookstores like Barnes and Noble, and I get to see the book on a shelf and it gets a lot more distribution and, and marketing, and it's I love it. Uh, but I also like to do uh, self-publishing. So that's the other side. And with that, I do these, what I call dime novels, uh, these short pulpy $3 episodes in these series. And, um, I did a, my first series was on, um, a young Lieutenant working his way up through the ranks in world war II in the submarines in the Pacific. And mm-hmm. so that was called crash dive. And that just went gangbusters. And, so I was like, wow, this is this this is really nice. And it has a there's a nice fan base there and uh, people really appreciate the books and the letters I was getting from 
you know, these guys who had served on submarines in the past and they're like, yeah, you brought me back. And it's just, I just love the, <laughs> the, the, the letters I would get, the feedback I would get from readers and that it was really meaningful to them. And they, they, they really, that, that did not only just enjoyed it as entertainment, but that it it um, it brought back, back memories for them uh, from when they served. And, you know, a lot of times you get letters like that as an author and it's like, wow, your letters, and they always tell you their story, right? Mm-hmm. And their stories were better than mine. <laughs> you know, my, <laughs> they're what really, ha- you know, their real lives were more interesting than my fiction, uh, what <laughs> my brain could produce my imagination. So I just love getting those letters. So I was like, well, I'm going to do another one of these. And so I did Armor, which was about a tank crew in uh, World War II, uh, fighting from Kazarine Pass in North Africa, all the, all the way, you know, they nearly make it to, their division almost makes it to Berlin. Um, and uh, now I'm working on a third one to make it a, tr- a World War II trilogy, which is a series. And the third one's called Strike. That's coming out next year. It's going to be five episodes and it follows a carrier pilot. And then also along those lines, I'm also doing a carrier pilot, uh, just two books, um, although it may end up being more, who knows, but that's coming out next year. And it's about a modern carrier pilot fighting in a near future war against China and the Pacific. And um, so it's a similar kind of flavor, but different era, different technology. And uh, those books are just tons of fun, right? I really enjoy it. And, and that, self pubs those two books that I'm self-publishing, uh, my agent's actually selling them to an audio publisher right now, uh, which I can't name because we haven't signed the contract yet, but <laughs> it's going to be a significant deal and they're going to bring the books to, to audio while I self-publish the ebook and paperback. Oh, wow. Fair so fair. super busy. Yeah. And, uh, I, and then we launched Children of Red Peak this year from Hachette. And so I've been... Yeah, just I had a month where with the pandemic during lockdown where I had my kids under wraps and I was just cycling through social media without actually reading anything, you know, just kind of in this daze, this this um, anxiety fog and uh, didn't get anything done. But after that, I just knuckled down, adapted and got right back into it. And I like to I like to write and I like to I'm a pretty prolific guy, so I just ha- kept hammering it out. I would say so. I mean, my gosh, that was there. There's five books in that armor series, uh, plus they're all put together in one uh, uh, bundle as well. Uh, and then you put out Children of Red Peak, and that's all just this year alone. I mean, oh my goodness, that's fantastic, man! Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it when when you you reach a certain point as an author where you know it transitions from hobby to um, to a career. And, and as, as it becomes more and more of a career for me, cause I, I write about the lighting industry. I do education and journalism in the lighting industry. I've been doing that since the 1990s. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I work at home, you know, doing that. And, uh, so, and, and fiction for me was always a hobby. And then it became a hobby that made some, you know, earned an income. And now it's becoming more of, more of a, of a, dual career and maybe hopefully one day even primary career mm-hmm. and uh so you know as opportunities become available you know he's like i'm gonna strike while the iron's hot and i do and i enjoy it so i'm just gonna do more of it and so i do as much of it as i can at this point yeah absolutely yeah i'm a very lucky man um <laughs> it's been a long journey it's been very gratifying very humbling too uh, uh luck uh, luck has a lot to do with it in success in, in publication. And, uh, you know, I, I was, I had a couple of lucky breaks and that's how I ended up getting where, where I got. And I'm able to write these books and know that people will read them. Well, I, I know that, uh, you know, that, that's a very humbling thing for you to say, but I do know that luck will only take you so far. You still had to write the books, which, you know, they, they are what they are, uh, you know, being written by you and, being what the books are they uh they're just standing on their own even if they had a you know came out at the right time kind of a thing it's still something that that you worked hard at and uh you know i'm, I'm just really uh, happy for you that you're getting to reap the benefit of uh good timing i guess well that's what i always tell um writers who are 
they're like, okay, well, do you have any advice? And it's hard to give advice because a lot of authors who, who make it to a certain point, they start to think that what they did is a, is a surefire path. And then they say, just do, here's what I did, do what I did. And, but I, I, you know, if I look back on everything that got from my point A to point B, it looks like somebody falling up the stairs. So, (laughs) so I'm like, how do you tell somebody to fall up the stairs? So, Mm -hmm. but what you just said is like 90% of any advice I would give a writer out there who, who wants to uh, write more and maybe do it professionally, which is be as prolific as possible, be open to learning, recognize that, you know, nobody picks up a violin and they're good at it. You know, it's the same mm-hmm. thing with writing. Uh, so the talent has a lot to do with it, but it's also practice and learning craft. Um, even now at my age and where I am, I'm a better writer than I was last year, but I'm not as good a writer as I'll be next year. Uh, you just have to keep at it. So, so produce as much as possible, get it out there every way you can. There's so many more ways to do so. It's so much more democratic with self-publishing, for example, and small presses are thriving, you know, get your work out there. And then, but then you just have to understand that there's this X factor in success, which is pure luck, having a right book at the right place at the right time. And uh, it's and you can it can't predict it. It either happens or it doesn't. I mean, for me, it was a zombie book. You know, back in the day, I was getting published by small press, and I wasn't real. I was doing okay, but for small press, but I was no great shakes. Mm-hmm. And then I wrote the zombie book on a lark uh, back when there weren't very many zombie books, and now there are you know thousands. But back then, there weren't there were hardly any, and there were only maybe 30, 40 of us writing books apocalyptic zombie books and i wrote a book of the uh, about you know our, what, what happened to the army during the apocalypse fighting the zombies and mm-hmm. um it was sort of like the world war z's the battle of yonkers but like the whole book and okay. it was the first book of its kind um and it exploded and it got me more zombie books and then they did well and then that got me into horror with simon schuster and then and then you know one thing just ends up leading to the other yeah but it, like you said, it all starts with with one book, and uh, yeah. Somebody somebody once told me he's like, well, you can't sell a book that you haven't written. It's like, well, depends on your level of BS of whether or not you can do that. <laughs> but you can't edit that, and you can't read a book that hasn't been written. So you, yeah, you, you got to write first. Yeah. So well, last time you were here, we talked about how your stories come about, how you go from genre to genre. I'm interested with how prolific you are. Do you write more than one story at a time? Do you, or do you just stick it out with what you're on? Oh, no, 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 no. I can't write more than one at a time. Um, I guess some writers can do that and my hat's off to them. Uh, some writers like to can write with, you know, like Stephen King writes with heavy metal blasting in the back. <laughs> I think that's cool. Um, my, my, uh, when, when, when I'm writing, it's one thing at a time, uh, hyper focus, total silence. Uh, I'm living the story I'm writing. Mm. Uh, I'm dreaming it when I, you know, when I'm in the shower or I'm driving, I'm con- I have a con- notebook in my back pocket. I'm constantly taking notes. Uh, I become super immersed in the story and, uh, I do tons and tons of research to make it feel lived in and grounded and, uh, yeah, so I give it utter dedication and and focus. It's like falling in love, but it's also like climbing a mountain where you, you look you look up at uh, at the peak and you're like, "Holy cow, that's a, that's a really far climb. <laughs> this is a this is hard." So I feel like if I were to switch gears and try and write more than one story at a time, I, I would be taking this path of least resistance and. Whereas you can't, you have to stick with it. You have to, for me anyway, you have to do that one novel and keep plugging at it. And no matter how hard it is, you have to keep, keep climbing. And uh, so you can hit that downslope and, uh, and, and then you're on easy street. Uh, then you, then you can barely write fast enough to keep up with your ideas. But that, you know, that's, that's how it is for me. I, I other, you know, your writers vary in their, 
process and so on. But I've, I've just found that to be most successful to me. Do one thing at a time, do it well, move on. There you go. Well, speaking of being up on a mountain, your latest book, Children of Red Peak, uh, has been doing really well uh, as usual. Uh, what can you tell us about this? Oh, uh, thank you for that. And that was a great segue, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, the, the Children of Red Peak is a it's a um, psychological thriller uh, with cosmic horror elements. It's about a group of people. They grew up in an apocalyptic cult and they survived its horrific last days. <clears throat> uh, when one of them commits suicide, the remaining survivors get together to confront their past and the entity that appeared on the final night. So the story is told in two timelines, uh, one where we see uh, the characters, uh, major characters as kids growing up in this group and how everything goes bad. And then the other years later when they're adults and they're coping with tr the trauma uh, and ultimately trying to find closure on it, uh, the tragedy they experience. Uh, the book is a, has a bit of a literary take, uh, so it's very character driven. Uh, thematically, it's about faith, family, uh, the fine line between belief and delusion. Mm. Um, and so the novel came out November 17th from Hachette, and it's available in physical and online bookstores. And the audio rights were acquired by Dreamscape, and the, the audio book will come out in January. Wow. Fantastic. And it's got some great feedback. I mean, I, I'm loving this, uh, this little blurb here. Jonathan Mayberry uh, wrote you a, a subtle character story and a chilling tale of horror. It goes deep into the heart of people caught up in terrifying events that fantastic. Yeah. The, the, the feedback, the reviews on this one have just been uh, absolutely wonderful. Oh my gosh. Well, what, uh, what's coming next for you? What are you, what are you working on next? Uh, well, right now I'm I'm writing the second book in this uh, carrier pilot, um, mm -hmm. two book uh, um, storyline that I'm writing, and uh, for the audio publisher, and so that I could self publish it, and uh, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to wrap that up by the end of January, and then the and then I'm two books into Strike, which was my World War II carrier pilot series, and. Then next year I'll be uh, writing the next the, the last three episodes and then launching that series as well. And then Hachette's interested in another book, uh, so I I'm trying to drum up some ideas that I can pitch to my uh, fantastic editor, um, <laughs> and hopefully uh, he'll bite on one of them. I you know I have to wonder uh, before I before we dive into Children of Red Peak I, I got to wonder. How do you determine which book is right for uh, for for what you want to self publish and what you're wanting to uh, hopefully sell? Well, they're very distinctive products and markets, right? So, with mm -hmm. uh, when I write for Hachette or another big publisher, uh, I'm going for something that's um, uh, more character driven uh, is a complete story uh, has a very 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 strong thematic backbone there's more of uh, their character arcs where the characters uh, you know are start out flawed and they have to change over the course of the book my self-published stuff's very different it's uh, the book first of all the, the books are a lot shorter they're dime novel length they're around 40,000 words instead of the typical 80 to 100,000 words and uh, so they're quick. The, the writing's a little more pulpy. Um, the, the character, it's a, it's a flat character arc. So we start off with a likable protagonist and he doesn't need to change. The world needs to change. So, and he's the agent of that change. So it's kind of look more like a, a, uh, uh, the movie Braveheart, you know, like, you know, the mm -hmm. Braveheart didn't have to change. The, it, you know, Scotland mm -hmm. did, England did. And he fought for that. Uh, so it's very, very similar uh, in what I try and do with my self-pub books. Okay. Well, that's that's great information and, and uh, good to know. All right. Well, you know, I again, I just I love your website. I love your blog. Uh, checking out your your book and movie reviews that you do on there, just fantastic stuff. 
And uh, I can't recommend it enough for everybody to go and check that out. Uh, beyond your, uh, where else other than your website should people find and follow you? Uh, they can, yeah, the website's probably the main event. Uh, that's where, where everything is. And I also do a blog there. So if they like my fiction, they, they may find something else they like as well. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I have an author page, but Facebook is, they changed their algorithm years ago. And so I don't really do much with that anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I have a, a, a personal account on Facebook where I interact with fans and, and other writers. And so that's probably a great place to find me. I'm also on Twitter, but I don't do a lot there either. I'm mostly a casual Facebook guy and, um, and, and, you know, but most of my, my presence is through my website and, you know, Amazon author page, Goodreads author page, that kind of thing. Outstanding. And uh, as always, we'll have links for that in the show notes, everyone, so that you can just click there as soon as this is over with. Uh, as always, Craig, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's, it's a real joy getting to talk to you and follow up with, uh, with your amazing career. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, time for me to step aside, light a cigar, grab a cup of coffee, and listen to our guest, Craig DeLui, with his latest book, The Children of Red Peak. Well, thanks again, Jason, and uh, thank you all, um, anybody listening, uh, for, for, uh, for listening and, and joining us um, for this great conversation. I'm going to be reading to you from my new novel, The Children of Red Peak. Um, the, uh, the novel uh, thematically uh, was inspired by a story I read in the book of Genesis, uh, where God tells Abraham to bring his son Isaac to a mountain and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Abraham does it, but at the last moment, God tells him to stop. A lot of people look at this story and they say, wow, what a powerful story about obedience to a higher power. And I read the story and I thought, I wonder what it would be like to be Isaac and tell the story from his point of view. And so that was, that was sort of the thematic inspiration for the book where we see a religious group that starts off fairly happy, but then uh, we see them receive new information. The Reverend comes and he says, we are, uh, I was contacted by God God is going to take us to heaven. We have to go to this mountain and we're going to be tested when we get there. And so we see this group logically and, and horrifically transform from this insular but, but happy religious community into what we would consider to be a, a, a very dangerous cult and which ends in absolute tragedy. And so we're, we're with three characters throughout most of this, the novel where we see them as children and then we see them as adults, as survivors of this. And uh, their names are David, Deacon, and Beth. And I'm going to read you a snippet for each of these characters. So this is for David Young. After years of outrunning the past, David Young now drove straight toward it. His Toyota hummed south along the I-5 as the sun melted into the coastal horizon. The lemon trees flanking the road faded into dusk. Most nights, he enjoyed the solitude of driving. He'd roll down the window and disappear in the sound of his tires lapping the asphalt, soothing as a Tibetan chant. Not this time. California was burning again. The news blamed the wildfire on a lightning strike in the sequoias. Dried out by the changing climate, the forest went up like a match. Outside the car, the air was toxic. A crimson glow silhouetted the Sierra Nevadas like a mirror sunset. Red Peak called to him from all that fire and ash. David turned on the radio to drown out his memories. He'd spent years forgetting. In all that time, he hadn't kept in touch with the others. He hadn't even told his wife about the horrors he'd survived. Claire believed he was visiting a client and not on his way to the funeral of an old friend to whom he owed a debt. He didn't want to go, but Emily was dead and he had her letter. I couldn't fight it anymore, she'd written in flowing cursive. All those years ago, five children survived. Now there were four. 
And the next excerpt is for Deacon, who is an indie musician. She drove away, taking his breath with her as the heartbreak returned full force. Sad, realizing the best years of your life happened before you turned 15, that everything after felt fake, one scene after another in a long dream. So good, too, like a long, excruciating tattoo on the soft flesh covering the jugular, where a single flinch could ruin the permanent mark. Buzzing with ideas, Deacon raced to Honey and got in. The seat behind the wheel, its fabric ripped with bulging yellow foam, welcomed him with a sense of home, which made sense for a man who had none. A long drive awaited him. First, he had to write these feelings down. He caught another Latin proverb tattooed on his arm. Abyssus abyssum invocat. Deep calls to deep. In the Bible, deep meant the word, the living spirit. Under that, no pain, no gain. Amen, motherfucker, Deacon said. He reached under his seat, his hand reaching against empties and ancient McDonald's wrappers and gripped his songbook, a black faceless thing he poured his howling soul into when the muse struck. Next, he thrust his hand in the glove compartment for a pen, which turned out to be dry. He flung it away and got another a flowing black marker whose scrawl would bleed through the page. Deacon wanted to write a song. No, make that an album, actually a concept album, a rock opera in which he would reveal to the world the beauty and the horror of the family of the living spirit. The gospel of Deacon, better yet, the gospel of the sad cat, an homage to Cats Are Sad, the name of his band. In this opus, he'd finally share the thing that for 15 years had lived under his skin share his pain in a way that weaveled into his listener's flesh, like an auditory tattoo or a new type of STD. By the time they finished listening to his story, they'd never forget it. And some might even join a cult themselves. Part of him believed. David could deny all he wanted while Beth wanted to have it both ways by attributing the phenomena to a glitch of mental perception, barking up opposite trees and both of them were wrong. Deacon believed something had happened up on that mountain, something that defied rational explanation. The gospel of the sad cat would be his way of starting a dialogue. He was due in L.A. in a couple of hours. The band was getting together for rehearsal to tighten up their set before tomorrow night's club gig. They'd have to wait, which would piss them off. Oh, well, this was art, which trumped everything. That included eating and sleeping, not to mention rehearsals. Pen poised over blank paper, he gazed across the ashfall and breathed the poisonous atmosphere that reeked like a chimney's sooty asshole. In the distance, the crimson glow outlined the mountains under a pall of white smoke. Since the wildfire had started, it had grown to become a breathing god, its clouds spinning clockwise like a hurricane when seen from space. Slowly, reality collapsed around his own fresh burns. The heartbreak of seeing his childhood best friend Stepford wifing himself, the exquisite pain of loss when he saw Beth again, the horror of facing Emily in her casket, and that church organ, <laughs> its droning and haunting sound being the worst of all. Organs always reminded him of his mother. We played so beautifully, he wrote, his ode to Beth. The pen paused over the page before scribbling again. We played so beautifully, but the wall fell down. We played so beautifully, but the wall came round. He'd write a song for each of his friends, render a few classic spirituals like Nothing But the Blood and Moody Goth, and build toward a dirty, howling climax, followed by a triumph, a vast choir of sopranos, discordantly heralding the resurrection of the dead, leaving behind only bloodstains to bury. Time blurred. His phone rang. He ignored it. The second time he answered it, I'm working. So are we, Laurie said. Unfortunately, we seem to be missing our singer. Screw your singer. I'm working. Silence on the line. Laurie knew what he was like when the muse burned him alive and that he always produced his best lyrics in this state. On the other hand, she was in a band. The band had a gig and the gig was tomorrow. And this weighed equally in her mind as she was a practical person who lived in the real world. All right, she said. All right, he echoed. Just hurry your ass up. Hurrying my ass up, right. He terminated the call. Shit. His fugue was over. Deacon inspected the pages he'd filled with black ink, violent as flame. His hands were smudged with it, 
He had no idea what he'd written or how strong it was. When he fell into the zone, his hand caught a fever and did its own thing like automatic writing. Good enough. Okay. The new album screamed for birth, but he had a gig first and in the end, gigs trumped all. Standing in front of a crowd and ripping himself to shreds, inviting them to share in his pain and survive it together. He read the last line of his hurried scrawl. The meaning of life should transcend the meaning of death. Amen. Deacon closed his book and roared out of the parking lot, bound for the city of angels. And now we come to our last character, who is Beth, and uh, Beth is a psychologist. For 15 years, Beth had lived with a time bomb. In 2005, Dr. Klein had shown her the bomb and where it was buried. In 2012, James Shambliss had tried to help her defuse it. Since then, she'd simply lived around it, which had required constant and extreme self-control. And over time, she'd come to believe she could have it both ways, a diminished past and a full present, but she was wrong. There had to be an easier way to live than at the edge of one of two extremes. For most of her life, her mother had held a kitchen knife poised over her throat. Ridding herself of the past was the key to her future. Despite all the work she'd done on her brain, she had more ghosts in her head than a haunted house. She needed to put them to rest forever, or else she might end up choosing a far easier path the way Emily had. I couldn't fight it anymore. As Beth got dressed for her jog, she decided she'd reach out again, this time with a specific plan. Deacon, David, Angela. Together, they'd go to Red Peak on the 15th anniversary. If the trip triggered anything, so be it. If she had a freak out, even better. Either way, she'd come home a new woman, strong and complete and wanting nothing. Dressed and ready to run, she went downstairs to the lobby where the doorman intercepted her to hand her a box that had arrived minutes before. The package was from Emily, as battered and heavy as the past. Like her mother, her friend had reached out from the grave to present a mirage of some elusive final truth. Holding the parcel, Beth sensed the answers it offered would only lead to more questions. A chain that would only be solved by returning to Red Peak. She opened it. All right. Man, that was fantastic. And that was Craig DeLuey reading three small bits from his latest book, Children of Red Peak. The book is available now. So make sure you click that link in the show notes so you can find out more about that and everything that Craig has to offer. Uh, Don't forget to also click the link for his website and blog. He's got some really great stuff over there. Uh, Don't forget to also click the link in our show notes for our podcast friends and sponsor alike. And hit that subscribe button so that we will see you again here in 2021 with a whole new list of incredible authors reading sample chapters from their latest book. Take care, everyone. I wish you all the best and brightest of New Year's. So, from me to you, Happy New Year. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.